So last time we were talking uh, near the end about uh, being able to check the accuracy of a syntax tree based on whether this reading from the syntax tree produced the same string that we used to create the syntax tree. Correct? That's kind of our litmus test for testing it. Uh, it actually allows us to test two different sides. Uh, the danger, though, is that you might uh, have implemented it the exact the version of the wrong way that exactly matches up with the way you implemented the other side of it so that you actually get the same string but you got it the wrong way, if that makes sense. So you could get a false positive from this, kind of like a pregnancy test, Simon. I don't know why you got to make it weird. <laughs> <laughs> you go to talk to Dr. Karyos. I, I just think I need to talk to somebody. <laughs> All right. I need an hour. <laughs> All right. So, in any case, last time we were talking about the grammar of statements. So, we decided that a Java program is actually one gigantic statement where a statement has potentially substatements within it, right? Okay, so a statement is either an expression followed by a semicolon, or it's an if statement. And an if statement is if, open parenthesis, some expression, close parenthesis, statement, or it's a for expression, where it's the word for, followed by an opening parenthesis, followed by an op text, uh, what was this, a, what did we decide that was? An op expression. I don't know why they say T in there, opt. Because I think it's for operator, right? Maybe it's OP and then the T for Tor. Well, if you say it like an operator, it kind of sounds like a dinosaur. But this is an operator. This is optic spur. Ex optic. Okay, so for some optic expression. Followed by a semicolon, followed by an opt expression, followed by a semicolon, followed by an opt expression, followed by a statement. Or they just had this catch-all other thing. I guess that's for uh, the else in your uh, um, parser. You know, more to language, more for language comes soon, or KK thanks. Okay. Yep. So. Uh, Baker pointed out that this weird symbol thing is for empty string, nothing, null. It's null, probably, is the best thing. So an opt expression can be nothing or it can be an expression, which seems incredibly helpful. Um, somewhere here, do we have expressions defined? Who just left? Shall we? Let's do a quiz. Everybody take out a piece of paper. Can I Are you serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get your name on it. I just turn it. No, no, it's a good, it's an actual question. Half sheet should be plenty. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Beaker. Yeah. At least you have more. You got like 60%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, Top down parsing versus bottom up parsing. Talked about this last time. What is the advantage and disadvantage of each? Or what is an advantage and a disadvantage of each? Top-down parsing versus bottom-up parsing. In fact, why don't you just give me an advantage for each? Because they, 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 they work hand-in-hand. Hand. Give me one advantage for each of them as far as why somebody would use that. 
Why would somebody use top-down parsing? Why would somebody use bottom-up parsing? One more minute. So you can get the answer wrong too. Now I'm gonna to wait to hopefully it can happen after three little right My guess is there has to, had to be more given information that Joey missed. Probably sleep or something. He probably walked up and took a phone call. I feel very confident. <laughs> I feel I feel very confident the answer I gave is correct for the information that I was given. Joey, you're missing a quiz. That's fine. You wouldn't <laughs> if you'd like to take it real quick, get out a piece of paper. Somebody was helping me here. <laughs> the question is, is what's an advantage of top-down parsing? What's an advantage of bottom-up parsing? Talked about it last class. Sure, we did. And you, you have like 20 seconds to do yours because everybody else has already done it. In fact, everybody else hand theirs in. And then I'll pick Joey's up when I'm done. I'm going to throw in the trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Mine was awesome to see this table. I definitely do not remember. Do I have yours, Walter? I forgot my front Oh, don't worry. I have them for you. I actually forgot about this one. I wrote down. I didn't write down. He didn't really say that one. All right. Today's safe word is frappe. Really? Simon, you missed it. It's what? I heard it. But I said today's safe word is frappe. <laughs> uh. All right, so what was the advantage of a top down parse? For human beings, human beings can more easily visualize it. What's the advantage of a bottom up parse? Not, that's not incorrect. Automated solutions. Yeah. Faster is not incorrect. Um, so I probably will give you no points for it, but <laughs> it's <laughs> excellent. That seems automatic. Thankfully, will not take a week. Huh? They they the the best answer would be that the top down parse is uh, more easily understood by human beings. The bottom up parse is. Uh, uh, for automated compiling tools, automated parsing. So if a machine is looking at it using a generic uh, parsing tool, bottom-up makes more sense. If a human being is working with a known language where they know the grammar and they're writing something specific for this, top-down makes more sense. Um, if for no other reason than a sanity check. Okay.
Okay, this is actually interesting. For the algorithm for creating a parse tree for this language. These are multiple steps. So this top step here. As we start, what would you call this? This is a token stream, correct? This is equivalent to what we've done in terms of a token stream. As soon as we hit a token called a four, well, as soon as we hit a token who, that contains a four, what do we immediately do? We know we're working with a statement, right? How do we know we're working with a statement? Because a four is one of the productions of our statement grammar, right? Okay, so we know we're working with a statement, so we'll immediately create a statement. Now, so our parse tree right then and there looks like a statement. But now we further understand what we're dealing with with a four. So since we've identified um, it as a four, we know that fours follow this syntax. We know that the next token will be that, open parenthesis, followed by an opt expression, followed by a semicolon, followed by an opt expression, followed by a semicolon, followed by an opt expression, followed by a parenthesis, followed by a statement. So the next version of the tree is they, it's immediately expanded where off our statement node, we can add all the pieces of this statement because we know what those pieces are. This is the look ahead. That make sense? We know that because we're dealing with a four, we know what to expect. And then it's a matter of filling in the blank. Okay? So we know the new tree, just still sitting on the same input, same, that same token. The new tree is a statement with all the individual pieces of the four hanging off of it. That make sense? Okay. Now, we hit the opening parenthesis. We're walking our tree. Do we need to do anything as, a, as it relates to the open parenthesis? Or is that just a literal? It's really a literal placeholder. It's part of the syntax for the uh, for a four. Okay. And we'll do the same thing when we hit um, the semicolon. The same thing when we hit this semicolon. The same thing when we hit this closing parenthesis. But for all the other ones, when we hit this guy right here, we're going to expand our op expression to be what? One of its productions. And the production that the op expression is in this case is a what? The null value. The, uh, um, is that epsilon? Is that, what the, is that what the symbol is? All right. I think that's the Greek term, the Greek uh, letter epsilon. Next week's quiz will be write the Greek alphabet. You've had math classes. You've seen mu. I've seen mu too. Okay. So when we hit, shut up. When we hit this op expression. It's going to boil down to the production of opt expression that it is, which is null. Then we're going to hit this other opt expression. Now, this other opt expression is this guy, right? Which is an expression. Look at our breakdown for opt expression. An opt expression is either null or it's an expression. Those are the two options for an opt expression. So when we hit this guy, We'll replace our opt expression with expression. When we hit this opt expression, we'll replace it with expression. And when we hit the this statement, we'll replace it with one of the statement productions, which in this case is other. So other was the cop out in this case, right? That was the easy version of statement. But look at all the other versions of statements we could have. Well, we can have just an expression followed by a semicolon. I guess that's pretty easy. Or we can have an if structure or a for structure. So these two would be our more complicated ones, with for being our most complicated right now. Okay, so this is uh, kind of a, a sneak peek at look ahead parsing. Maybe the better way to call it is, is work ahead parsing. Wow. Okay. So, I guess they're calling it predictive parsing, but work-ahead parsing is, uh, I think, I prefer that. 
Okay, so all this crap here is basically what I just went through. So that's uh, stereo instructions for what I just talked about. Okay, so here's our look ahead. If we see an expression, we're going to match the expression, and then we're going to match the semicolon, right? Because we know that's what comes after an expression. That's our, that's our, look ahead is really a bad term. I, I think work ahead is the better thing because we're not actually looking ahead um, initially. What we're initially doing is saying, we're saying, hey, I see this, so I know what to expect back next. So we are still looking for it, but before we look for it, we expect it. Okay? So we're not really looking ahead and seeing what we see. We're looking ahead know, knowing what we're looking for. Okay, if we're dealing with an if, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to match the open parenthesis. We're going to then match the expression. We're going to then match the closing parenthesis. Then we're going to call statement, which is this guy here. Why is this a recursive call? We're going to keep running into statements. This guy right here processes a statement, doesn't it? So the last part of an if is another statement. Well, I've, statements come in lots of different forms. What forms? The ones that this guy checks for. That's where our recursive call comes from. That makes sense? Now, uh, recursion. What's the uh, um, benefit of recursion and what's the cost of recursion? So, what's an advantage of recursion and what's a disadvantage of recursion? Say this again? Okay. Recursion typically produces less code. Sometimes the, the, the synonym-ish for that would be it's a more elegant solution. But less code is actually probably more accurate. Sometimes a recursive solution, especially a forced recursive solution, isn't necessarily more elegant. But probably some of the best recursive solutions are very elegant versions of the problem, but less code is probably the most accurate there. What's the cost? What's the downside of recursion? Mm, not necessarily. There isn't necessarily a performance problem from a speed perspective. Go ahead. Significantly more memory. Recursion is very, very memory inefficient. How is recursion uh, implemented, Skippy? I expected actually a significantly more incompetent answer. They are. It is implemented through stacks. Tell me more. Um, well, you keep calling him the more. <laughs> He's gonna be like, I don't know what happened. I blacked out. <laughs> <laughs> more years. Okay, so it's implemented through stacks. Keep going. Keep calling to get like the more localized or more version. I think you're looking for the phrase "most local -er. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the Windows expert, but that sounds right. <laughs> um, why are we using a stack? What's the advantage of a stack data structure for recursion? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, with a stack, we can push something that we don't know the answer to onto the top of the stack, knowing that that's going to be, from our perspective, the first guy that's going to have an answer. Even if he gets three down in the stack, that's because three other people went to the top of the stack because they were waiting for an answer. Who are they waiting for an answer from? The guy right before them. So, the guy beneath them on the stack. Okay, so we just keep popping off the stack. Now... When a method is recalled is, is called recursively, what all information do we need to store associated with the method? Because we need to put a method on hold, correct? So when we call it, like in this case, when we call statement, we call this guy recursively, all the stuff that we're currently dealing with right here needs to get put on hold. So what information, just from this example, what information do we need to store? What's the contents of our node? 
in our stack data structure if uh, um, we're doing it for this guy. Go ahead. Uh, okay, why? Because that's what it's reading in and it'll determine what it is. What input does statement take? Are you saying from the beginning it's like reading in the whole string? Or uh, all you have is the code you see right here. This is all you have. Yet we see a recursive call right here to this guy. So what information do we need to hold on to? What do we need to store? Because when we call this guy recursively, ev excuse me, everything that's currently happening in here needs to be temporarily paused and thrown on the stack. What's all the information we currently have in here? You guessed token, which isn't necessarily incorrect. You just didn't give me an adequate explanation. I wouldn't call it a token. I'd call it something else that matches exactly what it says on the screen. But do, do you see token stream written on the screen anywhere? Look ahead. So this appears to be some variable, right? Regardless of where the scope of this guy is, where he was defined, we need to put him on hold. Well, all the information you have is right here. Okay. That's all you have right here. So this is appears to be some variable that we're switching on. right? So if the value of look ahead is an expression, and look ahead clearly is a token. Okay? It clearly is, oh, that's why I said, it wasn't necessarily incorrect what you said, you just didn't give me an adequate explanation. Okay? If look ahead was an expression, we're going to do this crap. If look ahead was an if, we're going to do this crap. Um, but when we call statement, we need to remember that this particular version of our call to statement had a look ahead that was equal to if. Because eventually we are going to get the result from that call to statement. And when we come back, we need to pick up where we left off, which is inside here, our program pointer, this guy's able to resolve, and then we ultimately hit break, and the end of the thing hits. But the more telling example of why we need to remember would be in the four. So if we see a four, uh, let's see, where's my statement in our four? Mm, it's slightly more telling. So if I hit a look ahead that's a four, we're going to match the four, then match the opening parenthesis, then we're going to call opt expression. This is not a recursive call, correct? This is a call to another method, so but but it's still a blocking call. What does it mean for a call to be blocking? Can you repeat on call? Can you say that again? So like you one lo one log to go on and block it. Right. So we have to wait for this guy to resolve before we can go and do this line. So it is said that this guy right here blocks this line. Does that make sense? How do we know it blocks? Is there something uh, in the code here that just screams, hey, I'm blocking? Okay. I agree with most of that. What's the, wh how would you know something doesn't block? Either if it's advertised as being non-blocking, or the most obvious thing for us would be that it was it was done within a thread, right? So if something is thrown into a thread, that does that means it does not block. In this case, we don't see any special crap going on here. So before we match the semicolon, we're going to go ahead and process the opt expression. What's an opt expression? That's this function right here. This guy says if the look ahead is equivalent to an expression, match expression. Otherwise, do nothing, right? Because there's nothing to match. Because the other version of our opt expression is epsilon, which is nothing. Okay? So that guy will return. He'll either, um, he won't actually boil down to a, uh, a value right here. How do you know he won't boil down to a value right there? Uh, 
And I'll give you a, 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 a I'll foreshadow what a, a question I'm going to ask here in a few minutes is. I'm going to ask you, what does all this code do? So start thinking about that. How do I know that this guy won't boil down to a value? <laughs> yeah, it's void. Function doesn't return anything. Doesn't return anything, that means it doesn't return a value. But I'll give me, I'm going to give you a hint for the answer to my other question. Notice that it does do something. Okay, We'll have to think about what this thing does in a few minutes. So once this guy returns, even though he's not returning a value, he will finish. Then we'll match the semicolon. Then we'll call this guy again. Then we'll match the semicolon. Then we'll call this guy again. Then we'll match the closing parenthesis. <coughs> then we call our statement recursively. So at that point, we had to remember what the current version of look ahead was to remember that we were inside of a four. We had to remember that we had already matched all these things, that the program pointer right now is right here, right before our statement. And then we're trying to execute this. So we need to hold on to all that information, including this guy had a parameter list that took no parameters, including the method's name, which is statement, including what he's supposed to return, which is nothing. So think of procedures or functions, whatever you want to call these guys, methods. Think of them like a garbage bag with some compartments on it, or a backpack, kind of like a backpack. Okay, there's some known compartments. There's a return type compartment. There's a name compartment where you, you put the little tag on the outside of it. And then you have your parameter list, which might be zero or more compartments. Okay? And then inside of it, you have a local environment that has variables that might be attached to it in terms of scope. But this guy also lives, this whole function <laughs> lives within an environment that's a more global environment, correct? Can we assume that that's the environment that this look ahead came from? Why can we assume that, Skippy? What's up with you today? <laughs> Very impressive. I mean, it seems like an obvious answer, but you usually don't come up with the good ones. <laughs> Absolutely correct, Skippy. It's not defined here, so it must be defined somewhere else. I.e., the more global environment, or at least a more global environment, right? This function might be called within another environment, which might actually have a more global environment. We don't know. If we're sitting inside here, we only know about what we know. And we know that look ahead was not defined here. So it's either wrong or defined someplace else. Okay? So we need to keep track of all that stuff. So when you think about how recursion is implemented, we have to think about it in terms of the, all the stuff that we need to package up and throw into our data structure that we throw onto the stack, throw into our object that we throw onto the stack to put this uh, particular call to statement on pause. So consider how memory efficient that really is. It's horribly memory inefficient. Not only are we pausing things over and over and over again, the amount of stuff that we need to pause, that we need to put on hold, is, is pretty big. We need to store our, our local environment. Even if it's empty, we need to store the local environment. We need to store the more global environment, even if it's empty. But what if it's not empty? What if there's 10,000 variables stored inside our more global environment? I mean, hopefully it was implemented using pointers. So we're not actually storing all the values. But we have to store a lot of crap in order to make a recursive call. Recursion is very, very, very memory inefficient. Okay? Having said that, why did they use recursion here? And then my follow-up question is going to be, what does this code do? Yeah. 
You can answer those in any order if you'd like. What is this? All the code we see on the screen right here, what does this do? Here. There's all our code. Go ahead. Okay, what do you mean it checks the grammar? Uh, make sure you're using expressions correctly and everything's in its proper place, like all the statements are in the right spot. I assume if it doesn't match the next thing, it'll break. Yeah. It'll be right there. Right there. Why would you assume that? This one. So it's so the word match report implies. Oh, so you think that just the word match implies that? You're making some assumptions there, aren't you? Go ahead. From what I see on match, if I'm making any sense of it correctly, is it's checking it a different way. Instead of just one, okay, does it look the same? Okay, two, is it actually the same? Like that. That's okay. what I'm getting from it. Okay, and what else does match do? That uh, puts it into a, the next term of all. I'm assuming that's. Why, why are we making all this assumption about what match does? It's defined at the bottom of the screen here. What does match do? <laughs> this is what match does. What does it do? Okay. It takes something, something called a terminal as a parameter, and says, if my look ahead is equal to that guy, then what do I do? I set look ahead equal to my next terminal. What's next terminal? We'll go back to Skippy. What is next terminal not? Previous terminal. This involves the uh, scoping environment, Skippy. That's why I asked you. Not to find here. So next terminal is a variable to find someplace else. We can make the assumption, probably, that if look ahead is the guy we're currently checking. Next terminal is the guy we will be checking. Hence, the guy we will look ahead to check next. That makes sense? So we checked look ahead right now to see if whatever terminal we expected is the terminal that we got. If it was, good deal. And what are we going to do? We're going to set look ahead equal to whatever the next terminal we run into. Otherwise, what do we do? As Tina assumed, <laughs> we say we have a syntax error. If I said for, and I was writing a for loop, and the next thing I was expecting is an opening parenthesis, and I tried to match the opening parenthesis, yet that's not what I found, then we're going to scream and say, hey, you screwed up your code. That makes sense? Okay, so that's what match does. What does this whole code do? Now that you understand what match does. And then remember, I'm going to follow that up with asking you by asking you why is this implemented recursively? Why don't you tell me what all this does first? Make sure all your stuff is right. All programs are statements, correct? Mm -hmm. Talked about it last time. So we know to get the ball rolling here, somebody's going to call upon this dude the first time, correct? And then we'll let the chips fall where they may. We will either have some syntax errors or it'll be like that Plinko game, right? Where it just keeps bouncing around until we get all the different things. Huh? So you win a dollar, right? Okay. So this guy gets called first. What does this guy do? What does statement do? If you were going to tell me exactly what statement does, what would you say? Does what? Okay. Figures out what kind of state we're, that, that you just ran into based on the current look ahead variable, right? Based on what is our first token. 
since we know the very first time this guy gets called, look ahead must be equal to our first token. Okay, so he figures out what he is. He's either an expression, or he's an if, or he's a for, or he's an other, or, hey, you didn't even give me the opportunity to match anything. Your code is made up crap. <laughs> Therefore, I will report the syntax error here. <laughs> not only did you not give me the proper thing I was expecting, you preempted that by giving me something that doesn't even exist. KK, thanks. Okay, so statement goes through the process of checking our grammar for statements. Matching the different cases, maybe match is the better, is the is a poor term for that. Determining which of our uh, which of our statements, uh, which of our um, The rules in a grammar. What are they called again? No, they have a name. Pro pro productions. Which are the productions? I like to use the formal, the formal terms. That way I can ask you quizzes for them, right? Okay, so this guy switches on which production of the statement grammar we ran into and then has an else, this default guy here, that says, Look, this isn't one of the legal statements, therefore you have an error. Okay? So that's what this guy does. What does match do? Okay. So, is it fair to say that match determines if what you just saw is what you were expecting. If it was, it does the, ne the necessary next magic, and uh, life goes on. Otherwise, it gives you a syntax error. Okay? What's that necessary next magic? That guy right there, right? That's the next magic. What is that magic? What does that guy do? And make sure you answer this in, in terms of the biblical sense. <laughs> Check. No, oh, hold on. No, Moses, they were throwing sticks down. Things were turning into snakes. And sovereign Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone. It's like a big old frappe. Sometimes I question all the Christian worldview points that are in Jerusalem. <laughs> All right. What was the question? Oh, this magic. What does this magic do? What's the point of that? Move on. Moves on to what? Next token. The next token. All this crap right here does what? Processes our tokens. That's all it does. This is a whole bunch of code, well, a medium amount of code, that walks from token to token to token to token, determining if those are the tokens we expected or screaming at us if there's a syntax error. Does that make sense? Is this guy requiring that our stuff be stored in a tree? <laughs> That's his, that's his new email message. <laughs> this guy right here, does it care? Or do, does it require things be in a tree? No. No, trees aren't important. You guys want trees? No, we'll, we'll, we will have trees. So the last part of the question then is, why are we calling things recursively here? Uh, no. Go ahead. That's actually not a bad... <laughs> it's a little bit of a chicken or the egg uh, response, but uh, if you ever notice when you have an error in Java, it prints out a stack trace, yeah. right? So it actually is not a... Um, that's almost like an added benefit of processing things this way uh, because you do get... How far down the rabbit hole did I go before I ran into my problem so you can go and debug it? So, um, not an incorrect answer. Not the, necessarily the thing I was looking for. Um, 
probably a more poignant answer than the one I'm looking for, but the one I'm looking for um, is probably the more important one for us to think about from recursion. Go ahead. Okay, so we have a single data structure that holds all of our, our tokens correctly matched, so we won't go through any extra effort of creating things into trees or something like that for, to actually give semantics to them until we know we have a syntactically accurate program. It might not do what we are expecting it to do, but it's at least syntactically accurate. Also a correct statement, also not the one I was looking for. No, both of those are good points. I mean, they're, they're actually both better points than the one I'm looking for, but the one I'm looking for is an important thing as is part of the discussion of recursion and when to use recursion. Why are we implementing this guy recursively? Because both of his points deal with why are we using a stack? We don't have to do this recursively. We could still use a stack. Recursion comes with a stack, so it's... Go ahead. Mm, no, but I mean, we, we would know the length of it. I mean, we, we had to read those tokens into something. In our code, we currently read our tokens into a link, a link list, so we would know the length of that link list. So we do know how many tokens we need to work through. What seems to be good? Okay, tell me more. Okay. I think that's relatively true. So why did we use recursion? Because the grammar is recursive. I think that's an excellent answer. It just makes sense. Our grammar is defined recursively. Here's our grammar right up here, wherever it was. I passed it? Where? Where's it at? What's it here. So here's our grammar for statement. If, expression, statement. Our grammar itself is defined recursively. This is a paint by number. This tells us exactly how we should implement it. Match this, then match this, then match this, then match this, then hey, match a statement again. How do I match statements? Well, the same way you match this statement. That make sense? We do this recursively because it makes sense to do this recursively. And we don't really care about memory in this particular case. <coughs> Go ahead, Skippy. So this is because we also don't know how many times we're going to actually have to make the call. We could have a statement on a statement on a statement on a statement on a statement statement all the way down. And you'd have to do recursion to get all of that potential saves. Um, well, actually that becomes maybe even a reason not to do it recursively. I mean, we know how many tokens we're dealing with. But your question is, is how many statements are in there? I mean, technically, couldn't we write a program that is, let's just, so for the sake of argument, close to infinite in length? You know, couldn't we have a single program that contains 10,000 substatements? Mm -hmm. We could do that to destroy the memory. That's the punchline there. Is there a point where our source code gets too large that... Implementing a compiler this way causes us to run out of memory <laughs> at compile time. I mean, screw how memory inefficient my program is. The compiler, my program was so was was, was so uh, was such a beast. The compiler couldn't handle it. <laughs> Make sense? All right. Uh, we'll finish up the discussion la next time on Friday. You'll be getting your next programming assignment. I think all of your uh, homework has been graded except your last programming assignment. Your first two things are, are graded up there. All right, I will see everybody on Friday. Can we just ask you a question?